Welcome to our virtual information potluck. So we're all going to throw some information into the center and then we'll be able to have a bit of discussion and Q&A at the end. If you also wanted to have your supper on the side, that's entirely up to you. Um, so welcome to the Kairos Prairies North uh, information potluck. I just thought I would mention that. An opportunity for folks across Saskatchewan, Alberta, and the Northwest Territories to connect, uh, connect with the issues in that area, and to um, just get to know one another a little bit better. So given that I am not in that area, my name is Shannon Neufeldt and I'm part of the national staff of Kairos. I have asked one of the many other folks who are on the call from the uh, Prairies North region to do our land acknowledgement. So Javid, would you do the land acknowledgement, please? Yeah, thanks, Shannon. Good evening, everyone. Um, honored to be providing a land acknowledgement today. Um, I find that uh, that land acknowledgements can unfortunately often be uh, quite formulaic and and lack much meaning. So, uh, you know, I challenge you tonight as I acknowledge the land that I am on um, to reflect on where you are and what it means to be on the land you are on. Uh, I've written this land acknowledgement as a personal reflection, um, but I hope all of you can find some resonance in my words. So as a settler in Edmonton, Alberta, I have the privileges and responsibilities associated with living in Treaty 6 territory. I acknowledge that the land I live, work, worship, and relate on is land that Indigenous peoples have lived on since time immemorial. And that was generously shared with my ancestors and with me. I acknowledge that although treaty was entered into with the expectation of relations that would be mutually beneficial, in fact, Canada has dispossessed Indigenous peoples and continues to do so today. For this, I acknowledge my responsibility both as an individual and as a member of the Settler Collective. And I commit to working to change that and restore the spirit and intent of treaty relations. Thank you. Thank you so much, Javid. And I also want to acknowledge that today is Earth Day. So happy Earth Day, everyone. And I was part of an Earth Day celebration earlier uh, today, and I just wanted to let you know about it in case you hadn't heard. Kairos is part of another initiative called For the Love of Creation. And that initiative started on Earth Day a year ago and uh, celebrated today in the middle of the day with uh, time to reflect on our favorite places, the places we love, that will be the inspiration for us to protect the earth. And we also spent some time um, in some advocacy and action. And so I thought I would just share with you um, that campaign in case anyone hasn't heard about it yet. Um, and if you're interested, I'd invite you to, uh, for the love of creation, and there is their campaign page. So uh, an opportunity, three letters to various uh, federal ministers that talk about the need for um, reductions in greenhouse gas emissions, but also in tandem with um, reconciliation and uh, with recognition of the uh, situation that our use of energy has put on the global south. So three different letters there that are laid out for you to be able to sign and send to the ministers and your local MPs um, if you're interested in doing something on Earth Day or in Earth Week and carried forward even longer than that. So with that in mind, we um, 
also have uh, sort of ordered our um, agenda today with the various speakers who are going to share to start with some environmental um, initiatives and concerns. And so I would like to uh, invite Myron Rogal to tell us a little bit about communities inspired for environmental action. So I'll invite you, Myron, to just, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit more and to tell us about those initiatives. Myron. Sure, so thank you very much, Janet. Um, so my name is Myron Rogal, I live here in the uh, Diocese of Saskatoon, uh, Treaty 6 Territory and Traditional Homeland of the Métis People. And I work uh, for the Roman Catholic Diocese of, of Saskatoon in coordinating the Office of Justice and Peace. So I, I, I just want to say before I begin that I, I live in a rural area and my, my internet on a windy day I kind of acts up. So hopefully uh, you're able to, to hear this presentation. So Communities Inspired for Environmental Action is a local chapter of Faith in the Common Good that supports religious communities, uh, spiritual groups of all backgrounds to take collective action in creating more sustainable communities. So this, um, we began as a Catholic initiative, we ventured into the ecumenical realm, and now we've been two years uh, working as, as an interfaith body. So on March 11th, uh, perhaps like some of you on this call, uh, we took part on the, um, in the day of global climate action uh, so there were over 400 communities around the world that took part in this day. And our particular focus was on small modular nuclear reactors, which will become our focus for the next uh, few months, at least going forward, or SMNRs, as I'll refer uh, to, uh, to them from here on in. So I just wanted to offer a quick snapshot of why we have some concerns and what might be some alternatives to uh, what's being offered right now in different parts of Canada. So firstly, what, what are they? So the big difference between what you might see uh, in Ontario, say, or the United States and the traditional reactors would be size. So both size in terms of energy output and the physical dimensions of the plant itself. So these new uh, smaller reactors, newer smaller reactors, uh, produce a, a maximum of 20 megawatts. The ones that are being looked at in Saskatchewan uh, would produce a maximum of 13. So physically, the parts from the entire reactor can be created off-site, uh, transported by trip, uh, ship, sorry, or, or train, and hence the term modular. So a little bit about um, what, what their record is. So in 2019, we know that the uh, governments of Saskatchewan, Manitoba, and Ontario came together to sign a memorandum of understanding and that was to further look at the development of these reactors. So that has progressed quite quickly. And since that time, Alberta has joined in just earlier this month, actually. And so the, the only small modular nuclear reactors that we are aware of in the world today in operation on land are in China and North Korea, uh, where we don't have any safety records or they haven't been made public. So uh, the SMNRs that are situated elsewhere, are located on, on boats or, or docks, uh, on ports, which are mostly distant from human populations, or at least relatively so. And their safety records are uh, acceptable in terms of, of uh, what you would compare them to in other industries. Uh, yet the problem remains, uh, what, what is going to happen with the waste? And, and so this is a, a tremendous challenge. And so uh, what is being trying to be accomplished through these small modular nuclear reactors. So um, one goal is that they, in Canada, we know that anything that does not produce carbon is considered green. Uh, so many see these as, or some see these, I should say, as a gateway to greener technology. So they claim to be a, a cheaper source of potential power as well for many northern or isolated communities, uh, when really there's no more expensive way of producing power. But we're also told uh, that Saskatchewan uranium could be used in helping our local economy uh, to help fuel these reactors. However, uh, that uranium would have had to go through such an expensive uh, refining process that the economics of it would, would not be sustainable. So, which would mean we would have to import uranium from other countries where there's a higher likelihood of unethical mining practices. And then of course, there's a risk of, of transport 
uh, that we know enough about from, from oil already. But what are some of the, the negatives? So uh, the waste reduction sites that are being proposed right now in Saskatchewan are very near to Indigenous communities and as well communities that are economically desperate. Uh, so in southeastern Saskatchewan, the community of Estevan, who's being phased out of coal, uh, is, is a site where there's a proposed site for one of these dumping grounds for this uh, waste, which will come out of these reactors. So uh, it's, it's interesting that this, this waste will not be dumped in downtown Saskatoon or, or Toronto. Uh, so there's a little bit of an inequity here in that the, the urban populations will be receiving much of the gain while not bearing or sharing any of the risks. So a key question to ask is why, uh, why we are looking to be guinea pigs in the same category as, as China and South, South Korea in this realm. Another key question to ask, which uh, may bring some people on board from various political stripes, is the cost itself. So the cost is astronomical and, and could be a deterrent. So when you're looking at $300 million per piece, uh, plus $7 million per, per year for fuel, and that fuel needs to be changed out every seven to 10 years. Uh, the reactors themselves have a lifespan of 30 years. So there's much to be asked about what happens to those sites afterwards. And as well as the, of course, the consultation with Indigenous people throughout the process, which is its own category that I won't speak to really tonight. Uh, another huge red flag is the, the financing of these. So uh, we know that Wall Street and Bay Street have avoided uh, investing in these type of reactors anywhere in, in the Western world uh, because of their, their potential for low return or even loss. So desperate companies are now trying to rally around governments, which happen to be here in, in Canada. And in defense, maybe some defense of these governments, I think what they are doing is that for many years of neglecting the, the climate reality, they're simply grasping at straws. And so they're looking for a, a solution. But what, what is the alternative? So uh, perhaps the, the biggest distraction is that this would take us further away from investing in renewables that have the potential of uh, democratizing, democratizing our energy grid and saving the planet as well as our wallets in the process. So the financial cost of renewables is rapidly decreasing uh, while the lifespan and efficiency continues to increase. Um, at the same time, however, the cost of SMNRs continues to increase and at best they can be viewed as a very expensive and risky way uh, to slightly reduce greenhouse gases. So uh, perhaps I can share a little bit more about the actions that we're taking in the chat, but uh, thank you for listening and allowing me to share today. Thanks very much, Myron. And we will uh, hopefully have a little bit of time for some questions and answers at the end of all of the presentations. So um, we will invite you to make note of your questions and, um, and just to hold them until the end. So next in our potluck of information, we are going to uh, hear from Trevor Harriet. Um, who will talk a little bit about ecological justice issues and decolonization and more. So Trevor, if you are ready. Right. ready. Thanks, Sharon. Go ahead. Uh, I live in Regina, uh, the traditional territory of the Nihil, Lakota, Dakota, Nakota, and Anishinaabe people in the homeland of the Métis in the city where we just managed to get rid of the statue of Johnny McDonald and we're working on changing the name of Dudney Street. Uh, I'd like to begin with a quote from a writer named Nyla Burton who was writing in the online journal Vice. She says, if the people who have managed the land for tens of thousands of years no longer have full access to that biocultural knowledge and the land is being exploited by people with no understanding of where they are or for that matter who they are, disaster is inevitable. So as we know, indigenous peoples make up around 5% of the global population and they occupy, own or manage an estimated 20 to 25% of the Earth's land surface. And that land area holds approximately 80% though of the planet's biodiversity, intersecting with about 40% of all terrestrial protected areas and ecologically intact landscapes. That's a lot of figures, but what it means is 
indigenous people are doing a good job of looking after the land, okay? But here in the Prairie Provinces and certainly where I live, our native grasslands are among the most endangered and least protected ecosystems on the planet. And the landscapes that are suffering the most here and which are at the same time contributing, contributing the largest share of greenhouse gas emissions are the very places where colonization policy beginning in the 19th century cleared the land of its First Nations and Métis people. Métis people. So this, this is no coincidence. I think all of our issues around biodiversity loss, water contamination, wetland drainage, the destruction of native prairie and aspen parkland stem from that clearing of the plains. Agricultural settlement, oil and gas development continue to drive the pace of both the biodiversity loss and the prairie region's disproportionate contribution to Canada's overall greenhouse gas emissions. But this is not something that just happened 140 years ago. The clearing of the plains is being maintained today with legal and governance systems that are structurally racist and intentionally exclude Indigenous people from access to their traditional lands. Certainly in both Alberta and Saskatchewan, Conservative governments continue to sell off Crown land for private interests. In Saskatchewan alone, we are estimating that approximately 1.5 million acres of Crown land have been sold in the last 13 years alone. Saskatchewan's southern half is already dominated by private land ownership. It's one of the most privatized landscapes in Canada. And this excludes both Indigenous access and any chance of regulating, sharing, or managing land in ways that would preserve its natural integrity, its carbon storing capacity, and access for Indigenous people wanting to pursue traditional cultural practices, hunting, fishing, medicine gathering, for example. So following the murder of Colton Bushy, instead of taking actions to foster trust and better relations between settler farmers and First Nations people, the Saskatchewan government decided this was a good time to introduce stronger trespass law. Yeah a law clearly aimed at asserting settler rights to keep Indigenous people off all lands that are privately owned or managed. A law that the First Peoples Law Centre has argued is very likely unconstitutional. Excluding Indigenous people, keeping them off the land and far from the decisions made about how land is to be disposed of, managed and used is a recipe for more ecological disasters to come. I think Kairos has an opportunity to lead people of faith in Canada in supporting Indigenous efforts to regain access to their lands and their rights to participate fully in the decisions around how land is used and its resources are shared. To help Canadians see that the natural heritage of this country and its well-being needs to be reconnected to Indigenous ways of knowing and of governing the gifts of creation found in our forests, prairies, wetlands, tundra and ocean. In honor of Earth Day, I'd like to just close by reading a little excerpt from Margaret Bullet Jonas on uh, a book that um, she, she published called Love Every Leaf. It's about how we can pray in a time of ecological destruction. She says, how else can we pray about ecocide, about the death that humanity is unleashing upon Mother Earth and upon ourselves? How else can we break through our inertia and despair so that we don't shut down and go numb? I've taken to praying outdoors, she says. I go outside, I feel the good earth beneath my feet and the wind on my face, and I sing to the trees, to oak and beech, hemlock and pines, making up the words as music as I go along. I sing my grief to the trees that are going down, and my grief for so much more, for what we have lost and are losing, and for what we are likely to lose. I sing my outrage about these beautiful old trees being cut to the roots, their bodies chipped to bits and hauled away to sell. I sing my fury about the predicament we are in as a species. I sing my protest of the political and corporate powers that be that drive forward relentlessly with business as usual, raising forests, drilling for more oil and fracked gas, digging for more coal, expanding pipeline construction and opening up public lands and waters to endless exploitation as if earth were their private business and they were conducting a liquidation sale. I sing out my shame to the trees, my repentance and apology for the part I have played in the earth's destruction and for the part my ancestors played when they stole land and chopped down the original forests of the native peoples who lived here. I sing my praise for the beauty of trees and my resolve not to let a day go by that I don't celebrate, celebrate the precious living world of which we are so blessedly a part. Thank you. Thanks, Trevor. 
And we all talked about that five minutes is not very much time, but I hope you're hearing in people's voices a bit of what they are passionate about and what you can follow up with them on later in another context or later this evening. Taking us in a slightly different direction, although connected, is uh, Sean Sanford Beck, who is going to um, talk about uh, ecological spirituality and more. Sean. Great, thanks Shannon. And uh, thanks to everybody for, for gathering together tonight. It's really exciting to, um, to sort of be reconnecting with, with Kairos Network and Kairos Identified and Kairos Curious folks um, being part of the Saskatoon Kairos Collective a number of years ago. It, it was a big part of my life. Um, we moved away from the city and moved off grid and sort of uh, in some ways lost some connections with the activist side of, of life, but I'm glad to be, to be getting back into that. Um, and Kairos is a great way to do it. Uh, really, um, I was very glad to hear Trevor uh, talk a little bit, especially at the end, in terms of um, the need for the need for prayer and just how we're sort of, in some ways, as we engage with all of these different types of issues, we're we're reminded and called and and in some ways driven to prayer and spirituality. Um, that's a you know for many of us who are activists that can be something that sometimes we we sort of forget about a little bit. But anybody who's done activism work for a while knows that to to keep to keep strong and to keep the fight going, there has to be some roots um, in the heart and in the spirit. So I just wanted to say a few words about um, ecolog ecological spirituality. Uh, there's many different types of spiritualities that have grown up around social justice movements um, and that have fed into social justice movements and, and grown also grown out of social justice movements. E the, when we move from social justice into eco-justice and climate justice and eco-feminist forms of engagement, there's, there's also an ecological spirituality that sort of um, informs that. I think there's many different types of spiritualities. For some, it it's, uh, it can be um, can be tradition, very traditional Christian, or for uh, for some indigenous folks, very tradition, you know, returning to the traditions of the people. That's the spirituality. Um, for others, it's it's the new forms of creation care and creation prayer that that come out of maybe some of our our uh, evangelical partners. Um, also, uh, different forms of Franciscan spirituality that uphold a lot of uh, a lot of Catholic engagement with ecological questions. But I wanted to tell you a little bit about a new type of well, it's not new; it's very old, but it, in some ways, a, a newish type of spirituality that that I've been a part of for a while now. Um, it's not just a, it's not, <laughs> I love it. There's when kids are in there. Um, so I wanted to tell you just a little bit about Christian animism. So this is a, it, it's a um, sort of an idea and a movement that's been growing in different parts of the world. There's actually, uh, I put some links on in the chat there, but there's something called a Christian animist network that's actually growing. Um, and so Christian animism, well, I wrote a book about it a little while ago, a few years back. And once this book got published, I got this, I got this email from a, a, a radical Anabapt, uh, independent Anabaptist in the UK named Noel Mules. And he said, you just wrote about Christian animism. He says, I'm, I'm writing that book too. And so we just started to collaborate and, um, and he's, he's been getting a fairly big uh, internet based movement going of people exploring this idea of, so the basic sense of Christian animism is that we inhabit a world filled and teeming with a multitude of persons, only some of whom are human. And of course, we, we're, we've been, you know, for those of us with our ears open, we've been hearing about this type of spirituality uh, from our Indigenous kin for a long time. Um, in terms of trying to understand ourselves and experience ourselves in relation to, um, to the plant persons, to the tree persons, to the four-leggeds, to the winged people. Um, 
for those of us who aren't from an Indigenous background, sometimes we've struggled to, to really get the language and the sense of where, how to engage with that perspective. And so the work that folks are doing around Christian animism in particular um, provides us a way to, to, for those of us who aren't Indigenous, provide, begins to provide us with a language where we can enter into a real dialogue with Indigenous folks around what it means to be part of a living, a living earth and in right relationship with all types of other persons who are more than human. Um, I'm just gonna read you a tiny little bit of this and, uh, and then I'd commend those, some of those links to you if anybody wants to follow up. Um, and actually, I can't believe I talked that long. I know it, it happens. I'm a preacher. So I'm not going to read to you. I'm going to turn it over. Shannon's giving me the white, the white flag. So I'll turn it over to others. But if anybody wants to talk about Christian animism at another time, feel free to get a hold of me. Thank you. Thanks, Sean. And uh, we also know that we could go to the book to uh, find out some more about it. Um, I'm going to switch that spotlight in a moment, and we are going to hear next from Kathy Cameron and to hear a little bit about uh, the Kairos Regina group. Welcome, Kathy. You'll need to un unmute. <laughs> ah, yes, Zoom. Hi, everybody. Um, now I've just lost my, I've lost my, I'll have to read off my paper, I guess. Um, I'm not going to be as riveting as the other speakers because I'm giving you basically a report. So just bear with me. So I'm part of Regina Kairos. We've been active since September of 2020. We were just kind of getting going and COVID hit, but we did move fairly quickly to our um, virtual meetings and we've managed to, to be fairly active. So we have a membership of about 30 with about eight to 10 regular attendees at meetings. We meet monthly. Um, our convener is uh, Dan Beveridge. We have, we've been focused on a couple of main areas of concern and then more recently one more. So the first uh, area is climate justice and uh, several members participated in the Kairos Canada Fall Forum, the five-part introduction to For the Love of Creation last November. And then we hosted, um, organized and hosted a Faithful Climate Conversation uh, launch in February using the Creation Climate and You tool. And we had it was good attendance and really good feedback. And a couple of local churches have gone forward with that and now are organized and hosting their own conversations. Next week in April 27th, we'll be participating with an Ontario group in a train the trainer event facilitated by For the Love of Creation. And the workshop will help participants to better use the resources provided by FLOC. Um, we're also looking at the FLOC advocacy campaign, looking at trying to do advocacy with the FLOC goals, but work at the local level as well. So we're planning to have a local workshop around how best to do advocacy. We've got some local people we're gonna connect with. And then um, the goal is to begin some specific campaigns in the fall. Another area is uh, Regina Coalition for Public Transit. One of our members is very involved in this and has been for some time. And the connection to uh, specifically climate is um, quite evident. So Kairos Regina is looking for ways to support this initiative, which has the goal of increased availability, accessibility, and use of public transport. Indigenous rights is another um, concern that, that, that we've taken up. Uh, Sandra Blankensop is our convener for that group. And we mostly work with uh, Kairos Prairie North. So there were a couple of initiatives done in the fall. In November, we had a two-part embracing Indigenous rights, bringing life to the UN Declaration of, for Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Uh, some Regina members were involved in the planning committee and in the event, and that went very well. And we did a follow-up 
in March called Bill C-15, Step Forward or Step Back, uh, over two evenings as well. One was a webinar, and then the second evening was an opportunity to, for folks to have some sharing time. And a couple of us from Regina were involved in that event as well. Um, more recently, we have a member, Larry Newfeld, who brought forward, uh, he's become part of a basic income initiative. And we have some interest in trying to support that, even though it doesn't really fit under any of the five main goals of or pillars of Kairos, although I'm thinking maybe it might fit under prophetic witness. Um, so Kairos Regina is discerning how best to support groups working on this initiative in Regina with the hope to build a local network that impacts local faith communities. And we are exploring a possible education event. And that's it. Thank you. Thanks so much, Kathy. It's great for us to hear all of the good work that is happening with Regina Kairos. And it was a very engaging report, even if it wasn't all your personal passions. Next, I'll, another uh, bit of an organizational insight, we'll hear from Amanda Dodge about the um, work that Mennonite Central Committee Saskatchewan does. And I'm going to see what happens if I just replace the spotlight. There we go. I'm learning something. Yeah, my face just got a lot bigger. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so hi, everyone. I'm Amanda. I'm a fourth generation settler of British origin who was raised on Treaty 4 and has spent most of my adult life on Treaty 6 territory. I'm the program director here with MCC Saskatchewan. And it's great to see a couple of my colleagues from MCC here, Randy and Mark. Um, MCC is a worldwide ministry of Anabaptist churches uh, that does relief development and peace building. Some Anabaptists more radical than others, Sean, although I won't own what, how radical we are. Um, and I'll just do a really quick overview of our programs, uh, the local programs we do here in the province. We have an Indigenous Neighbors program, which creates opportunities for settlers and Indigenous peoples to build respectful relationships with one another and does education around race relations and meaningful reconciliation. We have a migration and resettlement program, which works with sponsorship groups to bring dozens of refugees to Saskatchewan every year and supports the resettlement process. We have a peace building program, which partners with local restorative justice organizations and also does training around the effects of trauma and works to address harm and promote healing. We have an education and advocacy program, which facilitates and presents a range of educational workshops that explore the root causes of vulnerability and highlights peace and justice work, as well as promoting awareness and engagement opportunities in MCC's advocacy campaigns around human rights. And lastly, we have a community development program, which uh, provides youth programming for youth in the Meadow Green area who are predominantly Indigenous and, new, and of newcomer origin. Um, and so that's a quick overview of our five predominant programs here at MCC Saskatchewan. MCC's strengths uh, lie in many ways. Uh, two that I'd highlight are one, connecting peoples. Our work creates opportunities for people to build relationships across divides. And secondly, around dismantling oppression through anti-oppressive education that meets people where they're at along the theological and knowledge spectrums. So I wanted to highlight a few of our projects um, that relate to peace and justice. And I'll start with our reconciliation themed projects. We have a really cool podcast. It's called Reconcile Everyday Conversations. I've put the link in the chat. Through season one, we heard uh, exclusively from uh, constituent settler voices about reconciliation and their engagement. In season two, which wrapped this year, we heard exclusively from Indigenous partners, and they were powerful conversations about grappling with what meaningful reconciliation is and hearing a range of views about that, as well as concrete and personal examples of engagement and reconciliation, which are great inspiration and modeling. There are study guides available for both of these seasons. Um, so it's a great thing to do as an individual, but also corporately in groups uh, at churches and organizations. Another project to highlight is called Reconciliation Ambassadors. Uh, this was inspired by the Circles of Reconciliation model, and it's brought together 12 participants, um, half are Indigenous, half are non-Indigenous, who are coming together, learning and debriefing together, and uh, having some hard conversations, as well as developing new friendships. 
And our first session was this spring and we plan to do it again in the future. Uh, thirdly, a rural reconciliation project. This specifically brought sermons, uh, a series of sermons on reconciliation themes to rural churches. Uh, we had follow-up sessions on Monday evenings, which expanded understandings of uh, realities and equipped people to engage in reconciliation in their communities. I would also name that MCC Saskatchewan, we are proud members of both Reconciliation Saskatoon and the Prairie Rivers Reconciliation Committee, which is a rural reconciliation initiative. And it was great uh, for me to work with Amy a couple of years ago on our uh, educational gathering through that committee. Um, our reps on these committees are particularly involved in coordinating the educational activities. Uh, switching now from reconciliation in particular to more general um, addressing discrimination, we have a new workshop called Training Active Bystanders. And this is a new practical skills-based workshop where participants learn how to intervene when they're witnessing discrimination. It explores the inhibitors, the motivators, and the effective ways to engage in active bystandership. So that's called Training Active Bystanders, and we started doing those workshops and had some great feedback about the practical peace building skills that uh, it, it equips folks with. Lastly, on name, uh, restorative justice or justice-related uh, advocacy. Um, in our restorative justice work with partners, we've done predominantly capacity building around funding and governance and promoting volunteer opportunities among our constituency, but we've also been able to be involved in some advocacy to federal and provincial governments for changes to the criminal justice system and particularly prisons. And lastly, we've recently been active with, this, with Saskatchewan's anti-racism network, um, its justice subcommittee in particular which is primarily working to build relationships with decision makers in the criminal justice system and providing educational and assessment resources uh, to help them develop a more anti-racist culture and address systemic racism in, in their ranks. Uh, occasionally, this group is also doing advocacy directly um, to policymakers. So those are the highlights that I wanted to share. And if you're interested in learning more or partnering with us uh, or hosting any of these presentations or workshops, don't hesitate to be in touch. Thanks, Amanda. You managed to pack a lot into your five minutes there. <laughs> so much great work. So next, we are going to continue with a bit of a reconciliation theme over the next two speakers. And so I'll call on Javed to talk about treaties from, oh, sorry, uh, fiscal relations from a treaty perspective. Thanks, uh, Shannon, and uh, yeah, you have a little bit, um, a little bit of a presentation here um, that I will uh, go through. Uh, just some reflections on uh, on Treaty Six and and relations between settlers and uh, Indigenous peoples. So uh, my name is Javed Summers. I'm very happy to be here. Um, well, I'm going to be talking about Treaty 6, and that's my context. Uh, certainly, I think my reflections are applicable to, uh, to all of the numbered treaties, and uh, that should mean most of us here tonight, I think. Um, it's a topic I've been thinking a lot about and, uh, and continue to in both an academic and professional context. Uh, hopefully, uh, you'll be able to take something away from, from my reflections here tonight. Um, so just a bit about myself and where I'm coming from uh, with these reflections. So I'm a settler born and raised in Canada. I was raised in a variety of Christian traditions. Um, I belong to First Presbyterian Church here in Edmonton since 2013. And I've worked for Indigenous Services Canada uh, since 2014. And um, as I started my career with that department, I quickly realized that I needed to learn more about colonialism as a contemporary reality. And so I headed across the river to the Faculty of Native Studies at the University of Alberta to do graduate work there, and I completed my master's there in 2019. Um, so the first reflection I want to share tonight is that, you know, colonial systems are the problem, and we as settlers need to take responsibility for that. Uh, I think settlers have been trained to think about Indigenous peoples as a problem to be fixed. Um, and this attitude serves the colonial system very well. Um, and it was the mindset I had when I began um, my studies at the Faculty of Native Studies. Uh, I certainly had the idea that I needed to learn how to, how to fix the problems at First Nations and I was ignoring, I think, the problem of Canada. Um, 
And so what I came to understand is that, uh, while Indigenous communities might have um, problems, as, as all communities might, uh, in fact, the problem settlers need to focus on is dismantling the colonial systems we have set up and uh, continue to perpetuate. And um, I, I'd like to challenge all of us uh, tonight to think about that, both how to dismantle colonial systems, but also um, how we set up and perpetuate colonialism um, as settlers. And um, I think all settlers have this responsibility, not just those of us that work for the big bad federal government. Um, I would also suggest that although many of us are ignorant of colonialism and maybe uh, maybe not so much of those of us here tonight, but generally as settlers, I think there is a lot of ignorance and um, you know, uh, it's not an excuse. Uh, the settler ignorance serves colonialism well as, as well. And uh, if we don't know, we need to learn. Uh, my next reflection is on Treaty 6 and really, you know, coming to understand that returning to the spirit and intent of treaty is a critical piece on the prairies of dismantling colonial sy systems. Uh, you know, I think colonialism and treaties are incompatible, or at least they should be. And um, so, uh, you know, as I, as I furthered my studies, I, I really honed in on Treaty 6 and what that means. And I came up with this sort of conclusion regarding the relationships Treaty 6 was intended to create. So Treaty 6 created ongoing dynamic relationships between Canada and adherent First Nations that were intended to ensure mutually beneficial relations in a shared space. And of course, we're a long way uh, from that vision today, sadly. Um, so in my thesis, um, and as Shannon introduced it, uh, you know, my thesis was focused on fiscal relationships, uh, which is the area I work in, the, the relationships between Canada and First Nations having to do with funding. Um, but since then, I've begun to think about uh, how this vision can be applied at lower levels, um, such as individuals, families, religious groups. And I think some of this thinking is probably a bit more relevant uh, here tonight in some of the work we're passionate about. And I'd like to leave you, um, you know, with encouragement to imagine uh, what it might mean to have relations between settlers and Indigenous peoples um, that are mutually beneficial, that are dynamic, um, that exist in shared space that isn't just geographic, uh, although of course geographic, but in other ways as well. And, um, you know, as, as Sean and Trevor, I think, um, sort of uh, talked about I think we should also reimagine um, relations as inclusive of land, water, and, and non-human beings. Uh, again, as settlers, not something we think about often or have been taught, but, uh, but an important part, I think, of treaty relations. And I just would leave you with these questions. You know, if we were to reimagine relations in this way, uh, how would it impact the way uh, you live, the way you relate to others, the way you worship, the way you work, vote, uh, spend money, invest money, and so on. So. Uh, thanks very much. Thanks, Javid, for that. Everyone is giving us so much to think about and some little windows into each person as well. Now, next, I want to introduce two people. And this was a bit of a journey to um, meet them and several others who I met along the way are also on this call. So next, we're going to hear from some folks about an initiative called Treaty Land Sharing Network. And uh, so thank you to everyone who helped make the connections so that Amy and Mary could be here. So I don't know how you're going to present together, but Amy, I should have asked how to say your last name. Sesequasis, is that close? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, uh, it's Sesequasis. Okay. Sorry, you, were, you, you were close, yeah. <laughs> and Mary smi Smiley. The happy one, yep. <laughs> okay, um, so go ahead. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much for having us. Thank you, Shannon, for the introductions. Uh, my name is Amy Sisekwesis. I'm originally from the Beardies and Okamasis Cree Nation in Treaty 6 territory. Uh, I currently reside in Saskatoon, uh, which is in Treaty 6 territory. It's the traditional territory of the Nehiowak and homeland of the Michif. Um, I am the Director of Public Education with the Office of the Treaty Commissioner. 
and through my role, partnered and joined the uh, Strategic Planning Committee with the Treaty Land Sharing Network. Um, and so what we know is that our treaties are the foundational building blocks of Canada and are to be nation to nation agreements that allow, based on that spirit and intent of treaty that Javed had mentioned, um, is based on you know, mutual benefit, mutual respect, mutual recognition. And so uh, the work that the Treaty Land Sharing Network does um, supports that spirit and intent. And so I'm going to read to you um, the vision of the Treaty Land Sharing Network. And it is that Indigenous people throughout treaty territories can safely exercise their rights and relationships with land. The mission, the Treaty Land Sharing Network is a group of farmers, ranchers, and other landholders who have come together to begin the crucial work of honoring treaties. In the spirit of sharing the land, we provide safe places for Indigenous people to access land and exercise their rights. We are committed to implementing the treaty relationship, engaging in ongoing learning together as we practice being treaty people and establishing a different way forward for rural Saskatchewan. Our values are is that Indigenous people hold both inherent and treaty rights to move free freely throughout their traditional territories and to use and steward the plants and animals in these lands. Access to land is critical for the cultural survivor, survival and livelihood of Indigenous people. As treaty people, settlers have a responsibility to share the land we currently steward and to work to actively remove barriers to safe access. It is critical for settlers to engage in ongoing learning together to deepen our practice of the treaty relationship. Even when this work requires us to set aside our own ways of doing things, challenge our perceptions and feel uncomfortable. And so I'm going to hand it over to Mary and she's going to talk a little bit about some of the highlights that the network has been doing um, over the past year. Great, thanks Amy. Um, so I, uh, I and my husband, some of you know Ian McCreary and Mary Smiley, we farm at Bladwer, Saskatchewan, which happens to be very close to the border between Treaty 6 and Treaty 4 on Highway 11. Um, and we are really thrilled to be part of the Treaty Land Sharing Network. Uh, and um, I'm, the, the, the piece I'm going to share with you is how this, how this works in practice. So we are ranchers and farmers, and we have are put together a, a network of ranchers and farmers uh, who are interested in, in practicing treaty by sharing our land as treaty intended. Um, and so that effort has um, resulted in this great partnership with the Office of the Treaty Commissioner and Amy. And we have, uh, thanks to, I got a prop, <laughs> thanks to, uh, Funding from the United Church of Canada, we have these fabulous signs, uh, which uh, farmers and ranchers can post uh, to make it easy for Indigenous land users to recognize that this is a place that they are more than welcome to come and practice uh, their Indigenous uh, rights. Uh, so gathering uh, plants, medicines, ceremonial, rock, carrying out ceremonies, hunting, uh, all that was intended. And so one of, the, one of the ways I like to speak about this is that this is an elegant, simple, simple, elegant design that belies the complexities underneath. But I want to just tell you one little story. So thanks to Amy and the work of the Office of the Treaty Commissioner, we were able to host a ceremony, a pipe ceremony and a feast here in my backyard <laughs> in Bladworth. And the fellow who worked with us said, you know, Mary, you know, you should let the people in Bladworth know this is going on. And unfortunately, my hairdresser had to cancel that week. So she was going to be my mechanism. But I ended up uh, having my neighbor from across the highway come over to uh, pick some raspberries. So I said, Janet, you won't believe what's going on here this weekend. We're having a pipe ceremony and a feast, and we're going to be doing some land sharing. And she said, Mary, you know, nobody owns the land. You know, great, that's great, Janet. So I just wanna say that what I think is so brilliant about this is that it creates the opportunity for me to have a conversation with my neighbors about something we all really care about, but we don't know how to practice and we don't know how to get started. So I'm, I'm really intrigued with everything I've learned from all of, all of you tonight. And you know, in particular, Amanda, that you're talking about the, 
the conversations we need to have with our neighbors. And I know that for the love of creation um, uh, resource is also talking about how do we have those neighbor to neighbor conversations? Well, the treaty land sharing network is one of the ways that I think uh, like I don't live in a hotbed of sort of progressive <laughs> rural Saskatchewan here. Um, we, we're in the midst of some pretty terrible, terrible uh, colonial practices that I think this one maybe give us, uh, gives us an opportunity to, uh, to change. It's, it, it was put together as a counterpoint to the Colton Bushy, Gerald Stanley mess. Uh, and I have high hopes that it at least gives us something to get started with. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mary and Amy, to introducing for introducing us to that great initiative. So folks, I'm going to take the spotlights off and we and all see each other here. If those some of those who are listening may want to um, put your cameras on. Another piece of this event tonight, besides hearing from all these fabulous folks and getting to ask a question or two in just a moment, is to invite you all to become more involved in Kairos Prairies North. So this is a justice movement with social and ecological justice that is based on participation all across the country. And so for anyone who is in Saskatchewan, Alberta, or the Northwest Territories and interested in these topics, you are invited to become part of the coordinating committee for this region, for these two provinces and a territory. And so you're all invited. There has been an invitation up on the website for um, a number of weeks now, and several people have stepped forward. Some of them spoke this evening, not all of them, but I thought I would just quickly name them. And so you might have that in your head. Would you like to work with these folks to coordinate uh, a piece of the justice movement in this region? And those that have stepped forward already are uh, Javid and Amanda, um, and Sean, who is coming as a part of his work at St. Andrew's College. And also, Kevin. Kevin, do you want to turn on your mic and just say hello? Hi, everyone. Do you want me to say anything more? <laughs> you could maybe say where you are, what to sure. do. Yeah, I'm a, a pastor at uh, Lender Mennonite Church in Edmonton, and I was helpful in organizing the Kairos Prairies North gathering in uh, 2019 in Edmonton that took place at King's University. And we got, we did a, we did a video presentation and a panel discussion on, uh, uh, what's that video called from Saskatchewan? Um, Reserve 107. Reserve 107, yeah. And so I was kind of curious of its connections with the other speakers tonight. But um, so yeah, I've, I've been a little bit involved, but I kind of do it off the side of my desk as a pastor. Thanks very much, Kevin. And so these are some of the folks who have agreed to be part of the coordinating committee. If anyone else is interested, you can contact me. It's been me that's been emailing you about this event and I can put my email back in the chat as well. But enough about that. For, for now, I want to open up the floor and see if there's anyone else who wants to offer something or to ask a question. And I see that Marcella has um, put up her hand. So I'm gonna start with you. Hi, I just wanted to add to Amy and um, Mary's uh, presentation. Um, the Treaty Land Sharing Network uh, initiated by the National Farmers Union Saskatchewan section, but we have across Canada um, treaty something program anyway um, across Canada. And so um, the, the TLSM is, is 
just for Saskatchewan that says as far as I know. So I just wanted, because of the Colton thing, I wanted to say that not all farmers took the position that the Stanley farmers did. <laughs> so um, just so that you know, there's two different kinds of farmers out there. Wendy, I was calling on you for your question or comment. Um, I'd like to just comment by um, letting everybody know of something that is happening. Um, uh, probably most likely uh, an ecological justice type of uh, issue that is happening here in Alberta, primarily in southern Alberta. Uh, there's been a resurgence of uh, mountaintop removal coal mining in the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains, um, especially in the Crow's Nest Pass area. There are mines and explorations and leases happening throughout the eastern slopes of the Rocky Mountains, all the way up into northern Alberta into the Hinton area. Um, there are a number my primary um, engagement in, in all of this has been through MacKillop United Church here in Lethbridge. They have a, um, they've uh, dedicated a part on their website that has a whole bunch of information um, about the, uh, we actually had a demonstration, well, not a demonstration, a, um, a, a protest uh, march that we had today. Um, and uh, it ties in very much to some of the political um, policies uh, that um, the gov current government of Alberta has uh, going right now. First, they rescinded the policy that allowed for um, the resurgence of coal mining. And it is actually foreign um, companies from Australia who have come and started to do the mining. And uh, in my area, I'm not sure what, uh, uh, who the owners and the proprietors of the mines are in um, the northern part of Alberta along the uh, Rocky Mountains. Um, it is of concern, I think, to everybody that uh, from this watershed all the way into um, Manitoba, uh, because that's the way our uh, water will drain out. And the number one concern that we have, besides the fact that it is removal of mountaintops, um, is uh, the contaminants, primarily selenium. Um, there's, uh, uh, that contamination is going to flow down the river um, and um, Alberta has uh, water uh, sharing agreements with Saskatchewan, uh, which uh, eventually is gonna flow into, it will go as far as the Hudson's Bay. And uh, we have um, a very active, um, letter writing and we've done a number of uh, web webinars with a lot of um, uh, like-minded uh, organizations uh, um, who've had some very distinguished speakers, um, um, uh, the Wildlife Foundation, the Yukon, uh, Yellowstone to Yukon group. Um, there is uh, the, um, the Kainai, the Blackfoot Confederacy, the Kainai tribe here has a, um, uh, a group of First Nations women um, who have uh, petitioned as interveners um, uh, all the way to the federal level. And um, by June, um, it, because of the way of the approvals for uh, um, uh, resource extraction goes, um, it has, uh, for all intents and purposes, cleared uh, provincial uh, regulations. It is now uh, over into the federal authorities, which will be um, making a decision in June. So um, we've been Wendy. doing some Thanks for letter another. writing campaign. Go to the website, you'll find a whole bunch of information there. If you have uh, the name of the website or the link that you're able to share with us, uh, that'll help everyone out. Thanks for sharing, Wendy. Folks, I realize we have come to the hour. We have already uh, had a, a few people needed to slip away. I want to thank you so much for your uh, attendance here. I did put on the uh, agenda that I circulated to the speakers that we would have an optional lobby time. This is maybe modeled after uh, what happens in my church at the end of a service is that uh, it becomes a bit of a free for all. Um, if people want to have some conversation and um, as you would at the end of an in-person meeting, 
I will stay on for the next, maybe we'll see how the conversation goes up to half an hour or so. And uh, if it, or, if, and if you have questions of others who stay on, we can have a little bit more conversation. But thank you all for coming. And this is the end of our formal part of our potluck. So feel free at this point, if you want to just unmute yourself, say hello to someone or goodbye to someone. If you have a question for someone who's still here. Talk. Hi, Shannon. Hello. I got lots of news. Yeah? Um, I filed a complaint with the Canadian Transportation Agency. Mm -hmm. There's a private bus system called Rider Express. I'm a wheelchair user. It's not wheelchair accessible. Mm -hmm. And the CTA ruled in my favor. Excellent. And they've given them a whole bunch of things to meet that Great. I wouldn't have even dreamt of. So Excellent. that's that's good for that. But the other thing I wanted to mention was about Indigenous people. My friend Sue went, she had hip surgery. Um, I don't know if I've said this story before. She went to sail the Saskatchewan AIDS for independent living. And there was a requisition that was given to her by the hospital to fulfill so she gave it to the sale and they got all the things for her she needed a wheelchair etc she showed them her health card it has an r on it registered indian they took all the stuff back yeah. saskatchewan is the only place in canada that has that mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, she went to Prairie Heart Mobility. Bless their hearts. They yeah. were the only good ones. Yeah. They deal with Ottawa. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what Ottawa sends them is the cheapest, the mm -hmm. poorest quality, the least affordable. That's garbage. Mm -hmm. So Dan with Prairie Heart Mobility usually sucks it up. And doesn't charge full price or something. But anyway, she ended up purchasing her own. Mm -hmm. What's wrong with that picture? Mm -hmm. We that took their land. Like pretty, does it? We took their land and now we're taking the rest of. Mm -hmm. To this day, colonialism is so well established in Saskatchewan, it's pathetic. We're glad you're here, Terry. Uh -huh, to help us be part of, to be with everyone, to be dismantling. Yeah, so we've got a meeting next week with the mayor in Regina. Excellent. This is about the third one about, well, um, Buffalo Meadows and Buffalo Pool. Mm -hmm. And we want it changed, as Trevor was saying, from Dudney Avenue. But she doesn't want to call it Buffalo. She, uh, the mayor says she, she says it should be called Tatanka, which is another word for Buffalo, but that's all right. Yeah. And like there's a street in Regina that was called South Railway, and it was changed in the 70s. There were no, nothing was really said about any of it. Mm -hmm. They changed the name to Saskatchewan Drive. You know, and if they can do that, realize there's 20, 2,500 addresses that are going to be affected. Mm -hmm. But would you put a Hitler Avenue in a Jewish neighborhood? <laughs> That's all I have to say. Thanks. You're nothing if not persistent, Terry. So you go. <laughs>
You go. Thank you, Kathy. Thanks, Terry. Thanks for sharing. I never understood that in Saskatchewan when the um, the federal presence for health care for our Indigenous peoples. It's always been a puzzle to me. I, I don't really understand it. And I think that's probably what was happening with that gal that you were talking about, Terry. Yeah. yeah. They, as soon as they see the R, they say, oh, that's federal. That's federal. They, we don't, we don't have to deal with you. And it's, it's creates a lot of problems. And did you say Saskatchewan is the only place that has that? I sure did. Wow. And folks should know that there is something called Jordan's principle that, um, because it, it was uh, based on a child, Jordan, who died, uh, never having been able to go home with home care because the governments couldn't decide who, who would pay for it. Should it be provincial? Should it be federal? Um, and so the, the principle is the patient gets the care first and they argue about the bills later. Um, so Jordan's principle, if you, your friends, your community come up against that where they're not, um, they're not uh, agreeing to give care because someone else should pay for it, um, know that, that they, the decisions have been upheld in the courts that the patients should receive care and the governments can argue about the bills later. Hmm. But then I thought that was only for youth. I don't know if I know the details, but uh, mm. yeah, that'd be something to look up. It would be it would be a hard thing to argue, though. Um, Any of it's a hard thing to argue. I, I think I think you you know you probably could apply it and take it to court. Anyway, yeah, I'd forgotten about that. Cecile, you uh, wanted to jump in the conversation. Yes, it's kind of back to the uh, treaty land sharing. And uh, somebody mentioned that it started within the National Farmers Union. Mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there's any initiatives happening, for instance, in Alberta or not, or how that could get started. Mm -hmm. Valerie, are you are you gonna speak to that? I can speak to that. Apologies for my interruption earlier. I didn't realize my mic was off. I don't know how much of the diaper change is narrated for everyone. But um, yeah, it wasn't actually started within the National Farmers Union, although a lot of the members are members of the National Farmers Union. And I, I'm actually keeping a list of. Albertans who have asked that exact same question and I'm sort of waiting for a threshold to all kind of connect them and say you know make it happen connect because I'm thinking Sorry, of uh, a couple of areas now. pardon I was just gonna say I can leave my phone number and email in the chat if you'd like to talk about it more sometime but um, I think mostly we just need you know a core group of people who are interested in getting something mm -hmm. off the ground. I'm thinking uh, there's a couple of areas that would be probably most uh, sort of needful of that. And that would be sort of up in the uh, Northeast of Alberta around Saddle Lake, St. Paul. And mm -hmm. there was recently um, two Métis men were killed by a white man right. and um, and then uh, probably um, in the Eastern Slopes where there is already some good work happening because of the mining uh, issue, but that could maybe be extended um, in, because there's so much ranching there and uh, positive environmental concern mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah, well, yes. If I could, Valerie Zink, okay. 
And that's what we're about here is making these connections. So folks exchange what you information you want to exchange and um, know, of course, that you can also come back to me if you didn't get all your exchanges made in mm -hmm. time or think of something later as I can dig up folks uh, email addresses. That's part of the reason that we make everybody register rather just than just handing out links is that way we can contact you and we can pass on information at the end. We'll glean from the chat in a for a follow-up email. I'm going to say good night. Um, it's been great to see everybody, some familiar faces and some new faces. And uh, I look forward to something like this again sometime. So see you soon, Amanda. <laughs> Mark and uh, Myron. Very soon. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> you folks have a meeting tomorrow morning? Next week, I think. <laughs> Good night, all. Thank you very much for hosting this. <laughs>